It's from our classic album of the day on Six Music, a record which I still believe is one of the best records of uh, the punk era and beyond, actually. A record which expressed not just a sense of it's almost frustration, but also sketched the landscape of Britain, which was a little grey and a bit cracked. Uh, it was a record about, I suppose, being at a crossroads in a way. Uh, the album is Crossing the Red Sea with the adverts, the front man, the wordsmith of the adverts, TV Smith, is here. Thank you very much uh, for coming in. Uh, so One Chord Wonders suggests hers. You couldn't have written a better expression of punk, really. Really, as an opening salvo, could you? One Call Wonders? Well, I mean, that's what it was. It was starting and uh, we could feel something was in the air and uh, I wanted to say something about it. And but even, even then, in, in, its, in its lyrics, it, there was this, it, had that, it had the mixture of assurance and insecurity. Yeah, well, it, it was, you know, I was cynical. I'm, I've always been cynical. That's, yeah, that's what <laughs> from who I a am. Very, from a very early age? Uh, what, yeah, I was a cynical baby, actually. Well, yeah, yeah. My, <laughs> my mother tells me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think you have to always look at things with a, with a cynical eye, really, and because uh, otherwise so much gets thrown at you that actually you don't personally believe in that you have to look a little sort mm. of aside at, at, at the subject. That's what I always tried to do around the time when, when punk was starting off and One Called Wonders was a... Do, you know, do you think that's one of the reasons why people took to the adverts in your work and still do probably still you know these days with your solo work is that just that slightly wry slightly cynical eye on things yeah I think everyone's got that in them mm. you know who, who wants to be part of the mainstream you know you just get flushed along with the rest mm. so it's, it's always good to you know stand on the side and look at it from outside I think you can give a you can give a more kind of rounded viewpoint if you do that mm. Uh, it was the first single, obviously, but it's also the first track on the album, uh, which, as I say, it does paint a picture of a country which was, I think, slightly broken, but more than that, it hints, it almost hints at parts of society that were just a little bit lost mm. or isolated or had no voice, and sometimes they just weren't using their voice. Mm. That's felt, what comes across. We felt it? stuck, you know, we felt stuck. If you're growing up in 77, uh, you didn't feel part of this society that was breaking apart. You know, everyone knows about you know, the bins left on the street, you know. Yeah, the strikes um, of the, the, All the strikes of political unrest, you know, the sense that the country w wasn't moving forward and wasn't supporting its youth. You know, we felt part of that. And there was this, you know, great urge from me and lots of other people to create that and put that into music and create a scene where we felt connected in a way. Because yeah. we weren't feeling we were being connected from above, so we wanted to connect ourselves. Before we go back to the influence of punk and where, where you first became a part of the scene, when did you start writing? Did you write at school? Were you encouraged at school? Yeah, to I write? did. I did write at school. I wrote, did you? Well, I wrote poetry, did um, you? first of all, when I was a school kid. And uh, that was kind of the way I expressed myself, first of all, and I've sent up poems to poetry magazines and, and right. that kind of thing. And at some point I started realising I was actually putting words to songs that I was hearing on the radio. Right. And I thought, well, actually, <laughs> I think my lyrics are better than they are, because they were these rubbish pop songs, Good you know, plot. and I was throwing in these lyrics that were, was, you know. I'd love to hear your version of If You Leave Me Now by Chicago <laughs> or something, which is in the show. <laughs> but were you encouraged, though, at school? Were you encouraged, or was it just seen as, uh, well, that's just a hobby, don't you don't worry about that? You well, know? no, I think I was fairly encouraged, well, you know. I mean, I think, you know, if you, good teachers recognise what their pupils are talented at, and I was clearly good at art and literature and, uh, and rubbish at science <laughs> and maths <laughs> and so forth. So, I mean, that was the only way to go, really. So when did you leave school and what did you do after that? Well, I, I left school and went to art college for a year. Did you? To the, the old traditional way, yeah. way of, of kids who don't know what they're doing next in life. Yeah. And I'd already had a band at school. And we played our first gig at lunchtime on the, in the school assembly hall. <laughs> and it was glam, so I dressed up, I put all the glitter and makeup on and had to do the maths lesson, you know, with glitter dripping out of my hair in the afternoon. <laughs> So then when I went to art college, I didn't, I didn't really have, have an art career in mind, but it gave me the, the freedom to, I immediately uh, started my next band in art college yeah. and went all the time rehearsing. And, uh, how, how on earth did you end up in Devon? Then. I was born in uh, in Essex. My parents were, were both teachers themselves and moved down to Devon right, that's when, I was, when I was about nine years old. You were born in Romford or somewhere. Yeah, that's somewhere right. right. Yeah. So you leave school, you go to art college. So where did you go to art college? In Torquay. In, in Torquay. Yeah. So when does punk come along and what what does it mean? How did you discover that there was this thing happening? Well, I had my sort of glam band going in Torquay, really, and getting nowhere. You know, I was playing village halls and this sort of thing. And I remember supporting George Melly. That was the nearest we got to. <laughs> we got, <laughs> got to be in the area that we wanted to be in and then I think the first you know it was clear that nothing was going to happen down there you know yeah uh, I mean people wanted to hear bands that did covers of free yeah. you know War Chicago like you say you yeah. know all people wanted was cover bands and uh, we were doing my own songs getting nowhere and then I've 
I read the first uh, reports of the Sex Pistols playing in London and I'd met Gay by then and she wanted to learn bass and we just looked at each other and said, we've got to get up there. <laughs> you know? Did you, because that's the thing, so you moved to London, did you have any plan of what you were going to do? Did you have anywhere... Well, I know we were going to have a band. Right. You know? <laughs> where did you stay? Do you, when, well, where did you live? Well, we did a few kind of sorties up there to try and find somewhere to live and it was actually extremely difficult. I had, yeah. like, one person I knew up there who went and slept on his floor for a couple of times and then got yeah. a, a very outrageously expensive rip-off one-room attic flat yeah. on a three-week holiday rent where we could be thrown out of at any time yeah. but luckily that was enough to get our feet under the door and be able to put a band together so the usual kind of like small lads in sounds and enemy yeah. help need a guitarist yeah. <laughs> doesn't necessarily have yeah. to play better not to be able to <laughs> <laughs> well, here's, so there's two things here so after you after you hear punk you make the decision you come up to town but the idea of punk does that finally give you a voice and, a, and an outlet for these lyrics then so well, everything that you've been building up to all the writing here is something Something here's purpose and focus. Well, it gave it an outlet that much is true. I mean, I was already writing lyrics, and and some of the lyrics were completely written before punk rock. And I think I'd written one called Wonders before this kind of punk rock really? phenomenon really? actually started. Because I was in a right. band, you yeah, know, like yeah, I say, yeah. come back when you've learned to play. That's exactly what I was yeah. having every night. Yeah. And so then it's slotted. You know, the thing is, you catch the mood. Yeah. That's how you write a song. Yeah. You know, you catch the mood whether it's clear where it's going or not that's the whole thing to be in the moment and catch the mood and uh and so that fitted in perfectly when when punk happened because punk was just an expression of something that had been building up over the previous years remember it didn't come out of nowhere yeah. it came out for a reason because people were dissatisfied and they wanted change and they wanted to have something new i've now got this picture of you in your attic though scribbling away it just you know through the night coming up with songs an attic is certainly a classic place for a writer <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so you formally adverts uh, the adverts being a name where you plucked out of the sky or was that something which was floating around what was the well it's always hard to name a band of course we had endless arguments you know we were thinking of calling a band one called wonders itself for a start yeah but uh, it just seemed too much of a gimmick and we didn't want to be seen as a gimmick band really so i, th I thought the adverts had a bit more depth to it in that you know we are being pushed around by the advertising and by yeah. what you know what society wants us to believe and what they want us to buy and uh, and so that was the name for that band, really. Uh, you played a number of gigs, uh, well, around London. You played the Ro I was reading somewhere you played the Roxy nine times. We played it a lot of times. We were one of the first bands in. In fact, we played the first week it opened. We played there twice. Because <laughs> yeah. the Roxy was the legendary one, wasn't it? Yeah. That was that was the home, really. Of That's where it, you know, with, without the Roxy, there wouldn't have been a, a punk rock movement. You might have had the you know the Pistols and you might have had the Jam and the mm. Clash, but there wouldn't have been a movement per se without that place where everyone could go and uh, gather around. And what, what was your first gig like? It was terrible. <laughs> 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 everyone, everyone thinks the Roxy was like some <laughs> really happening place, but I mean, the first time we played there, there was probably about 30 people standing there, and they were halfway back the room, you know. And I was having to walk off stage and cajole them to say, yeah, yeah you lot, cow on, get near the stage. And the weird thing was, like, Johnny Rotten was in the audience, and afterwards he said to me, TV, don't get off the stage. The stage is your place. <laughs> really? So, and I never have right. since. I think he's absolutely right. Yeah. You know, you'd, uh, every time I see a, a, a musician who comes off stage and, you know, goes and goes direct to his audience, saying, oh, don't do that. It looks bad. It looks <laughs> terrible. You know, and it's actually insecurity that makes you want to go out and reach them by being right in front of them. In fact, because notoriously, uh, people say of you at that time, as read the song, you couldn't play. Mm. There was a, there's a famous advert, isn't there? For the time you went on tour with The Damned, mm. the adverts no one chord, The Damned no three. Come and see all four chords That's on right. tour, is that right? Classic poster as well. Stiff records were so brilliant at that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, no, we couldn't play. I mean, let's, you know, basically. I mean, Gay learnt, learnt guitar to be in the band, so she, what she learnt was the songs. Mm. Laurie basically bluffed his way into the audition because we were desperate for a drummer and literally learnt to play in the rehearsals. Mm. Uh, the only one of us who could actually play was Howard because I couldn't play guitar <laughs> well enough to play my own songs on stage, so I had to get a guitarist in. <laughs> Stiff Records sign you up, you do one called Wonders, and then Gary Gilmore's Eyes is the second single, is that your second single? Or uh, the third one? Uh, that was the third, third single. Was, it's was, early on, though, isn't it? I don't know, actually. I can't 70, remember. It's still 77. You no, it was, you, it was the second single. You, you haven't been together that long. And Gary Gilmore's Eyes, which is an amazing song, it was the first song I ever heard. And I remember thinking, what, what is this about? This is not what most pop songs are about. Because mm. you have to put it in concert. So anyway, it goes top 20. For a start, that must be a bit surreal. 
Yeah, well, we, moved to London, we'd only be going it. six months yeah. and we were on top of the pops all of a sudden. It was certainly weird. You know, we worked for it. You know, in a way, it all made a kind of sense. You know, you could see, you could feel you were a part of a movement. You could feel the way it was pushing. And as soon as I wrote, wrote Gary Gilmore's eyes, I thought, well, this is sick. But it, actually, it's a hit record, you know, yeah. even though it's sick. It can get through under the radar as a novelty record. But most pop records aren't about an American... Uh, who's demanded to be executed for the murders he's committed, and then has offered up his eyes to medical science. Where did that come from? Well, I didn't have to make up much, you know. No. I mean, it, it's true. But just the, the idea, I'm gonna, this is yeah. what I'm going to write yeah. about, because yeah. this is what sets you apart from a lot of your peers at the time, whose language was quite brutal in places mm. and abrupt. But you've written this, again, it's, it's almost poetic. Yeah, well, that's you know that's what you do when you write. You, something strikes you, you, you write it out, and you push it further, and you try and mm -hmm. embellish it a bit. And I just like the idea of turning that story, which was absolutely true, you know, and it was being exploited. It was all over the media at the time, mm -hmm. you know, because he was okay. He was a small town murderer, a bit of a fool, and he killed a couple of people. It was a sad story, actually. But in the end, you know, the liberals were trying to, to stop him being executed, trying to get a stay of execution. He was actually going, you know what? I did it. Just kill me now and I will donate my retinas and at least I've done something good out of my miserable life that's what he was saying it was a fascinating story about a very tragic character mm -hmm. and uh, I just thought it was a good thing to write about it and, and actually turn it into a bit of a sort of a horror story mm -hmm. and also to satirise the way the media were approaching it which was in a very one dimensional way so I thought if I write a very gothic horror one dimensional song about it then that also has a, does a job of satirising the media approach to it and to put that into context, uh, in the top ten the week that uh, the adverts are top 20, Elvis Presley was at number one with Way Down, Float On by the Floaters was number three, Donna Summer was also in the top ten alongside Silver Lady by David Soul. Yeah, there you Is go. You're going to stand out Those on were the days. <laughs> you, you, you certainly must have stood out when you did Top of the Pops. <laughs> they hated us. They absolutely hated us turning up looking like punk rockers and being all moody on stage and refusing to mime. And Oh, they hated us. I watched it last night because everything's online now yeah. and uh, it is the it is this it's i mean obviously you you, you know change your memories of these yeah. things but watching it was like, yes i remember he's the man who had all the badges on yeah. Yeah. hundreds yeah. of button badges yeah Thunder yeah. and stupid sunglasses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hidden reverage sunglasses. <laughs> and that clenched teeth style of singing mm. as well. Yeah, I know. I was, that's the way I was feeling, actually, because uh, um, <laughs> uh, I had so much trouble asking to sing to sing live, because everyone mimed on top of the yeah. pops. And I said, I was very punk rock. I said, I'm not going to sing, I'm not going to mime, I'm going to sing live. So they do all the run-throughs, didn't even give me a proper microphone. So I was <laughs> like, there's no voice. And they were telling me off. I was being told off by the, really? by the floor manager. They finally got a microphone, and they put the backing track so quiet, I couldn't hear it at all. I could hear it was drumming, uh, lorry behind me going, boom, 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 boom. I couldn't hear a thing. So yeah. I was absolutely bluffing it. <laughs> so next time I did it, I mimed. <laughs> Lessons learned. <laughs> Tracks on the, the record to come after this. We'll play uh, uh, another track from Crossing the Red Sea. And this, this is one of my favourite songs on the album. What are the scary sounds at the start of this? Bombsite Boy. We went out with John Leckie, the producer, and uh, we went out to... Uh, we actually decided in very old school way to actually record um, some railway cuttings, as that's in the lyric. And we went out to a scrapyard in North Latimer Grove, actually, in the middle of the night with a microphone. It's a bit Pink Floyd, this actually. <laughs> I actually went out in the scrapyard and taped the late night trains going by on the underground. Because then that, it gives it a really sort of slightly sinister mood at the start of this record, as you hear from our featured classic album of the day. This is from the adverts, and this is Bombsite Boy. It's the adverts from uh, Crossing the Red Sea, our six music classic album of the day. I mean, that's got some of my favourite lyrics from the album. It also, you see, because before you know what, really what it's about, it sounds like a nickname doesn't it, the bombsite boy? It sounds mm -hmm. like something that people would call you, but where did it come from? What inspired the track? Because it's like this weird punk rock stick of the dump style touch yeah. tale. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's, it's about being an outsider. You know, in post-war London, it was quite usual to have bombsites left. It was a long time, you know, before they all got they got filled in with lots of money-making <laughs> housing yeah. projects. So, so actually, the, the, you know, the, I have memories of playing on bombsites in London and, yeah. and in Essex. But it's, I mean, also, it sets the agenda as well. So I can imagine, I'm, I'm just, you know, the whole line about not compromising that was very much about what mm -hmm. the adverts were about well. yeah in the absence of uh, you know feeling that you're a part of of anything else you know you're very wary uh, of what society tells you to do and i think it's very you know you find your way you find your way by deciding that you aren't going to compromise you're going to mm -hmm. be who you are it was like from this negative feeling that you're lost and you're not part of something 
then you can give a positive message that actually mm. I am going to be this, I'm going to be what I want, I'm going to do what I want. Don't be negative. P people think punk was a very negative movement, but it yeah. wasn't. It was actually a very positive movement. It was people in a bad place saying, no, I'm not accepting this, I'm going to do something with my life. Yeah. Although it also gives the first indication that this record is as well about uh, the increasing frustrations about punk rather becoming slightly watered down. By the time your album comes out, punk has exploded like a firework. It promised a lot, and for people who were part of it, early on was maybe it wasn't panning out as possibly mm. some of you thought it might no not at all it was such an exciting movement in the first six months and so many bands came up with so many different i mean the, the, the band, you can't compare the bands they all had their own sparkle and their own kind of excitement and their own kind of way of songwriting because when if you compare the damned to the jam to the clash to the pistols to the adverts to the buzzcocks they all sound completely different, mm. you know, that's the thing. They all had their own story to tell and their own way of telling it. And six months later, it was, you know, there was a load of kids thinking, well, if we get a leather jacket and play fast and hard and look mm. mean on stage and spit and stuff, then we'll be a punk band. And that would completely miss the point. Uh, to pick up the story, then, because you, you had lots of labels, didn't you? You went from label to label to label. Mm. Because you make your album, your album comes out a lot later than some of the bands that you were probably playing with uh, mm. in 77. Because your album, although recorded in 77, doesn't come out to 78 mm. what, what was what caused the delay was it just hopping around between labels or well, were you always on tour one of the problems was that because uh, having a hit single yeah because uh, the consequence was we were always on tour I mean as soon as uh, as uh, Gilmore came out we were, went out on tour well even just before I think for, for like six weeks with The Damned yeah. supporting The Damned the real classic tour and uh and as soon as we had a hit single, well, suddenly you're in demand everywhere. So we were just touring everywhere. We had the songs all ready to go, but no time to go into the studio. Yeah. So we didn't get a chance to go into the studio until late in 77. I suppose the upside of that is you can play a bit better by the time they make Well, yeah, the that's true. Well, we you had to rehearsals. Exactly. We are rehearsals on stage in front of the audience. Yeah. You make the album then, it's 77. I, can't, I don't know exactly when in 77, but it's, I imagine it's late 77. Yeah, I think it's December 77. And yeah. you make the record at Abbey Road. Yeah. Abbey Road. Yeah. Get you the adverts I in know. Abbey Road. It was so funny. It was so perfect, actually, that, uh, that we got there because we were in very, very safe hands with John Leckie producing, and that was, his, that was where he liked to work in Abbey Road. Yeah. Road, really. Yeah. Was Leckie still, because he was in the house at Abbey Road, That's wasn't right, he, yeah. for a while. Was yeah. that before he'd left, or was did he come back to do you? That, I don't know. Right. I think he was probably still in-house, actually. Right. You know, I really wanted John to do it, because I just felt like we would be in a safe pair of hands. I know he dealt with bands that could be considered problematical before, like he'd done the Doctors of Magnus album, and they were a pre-punk band who were quite notorious for not being great players you yeah. know but but with great ideas so i thought well if he can make them sound good he can make <laughs> us sound good <laughs> but also i imagine because like he goes on to work with public image limited stone rose mm. everyone but also i imagine, I imagine did he did he push you did he push you with the songs as well a little bit we had it pretty much arrangements we had pretty much sorted out but there certainly were some special moments that john thought of uh, you know thought of ideas for the arrangement that we could never as you know a year old band come up with mm. you know so his experience in the studio really really showed mm. and what were the other core themes then where if you if you look back now at that collection of um songs what were you attempting to convey do you think i think i was go conveying the sense of a, of a lost generation really not knowing where where it was going and how to find its feet you know in a country that in many ways i felt was equally lost you know like the great british mistake said you know, here is a society where you're supposed to fit in, but society itself doesn't seem to know where it's going. Mm. You know, and I felt that was something that should be addressed. When the, your peer groups are saying, yeah, we've lost our way, come and join us. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm at the first of the queue for that. We're, we're at the edge of the cliff. Come on, <laughs> yeah. follow us. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's quite, I can't tell you how much this record meant to me. When you look back at it, it still has an amazing urgency, and a lot of it is obviously, and I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but a lot of it's still quite relevant today if you pick that album out or you gave it anyone now and say if you haven't heard this record go and listen to this record still says something i'm still being told that yeah i'm very happy you know about that because i think good Brighton is timeless so if you address your themes carefully enough you know you are looking at a pattern that repeats itself over and over again in the world and you know unhappily that's mm -hmm. how it is you know mm -hmm. and social comment records tend to to actually always always be relevant yeah it's been lovely talking to you, Tim. Thank you very much for coming in. We'll finish with Great British Mistake. But now you can help us out with this. Right. Now, oh, great, oh. great British Mistake 
You see, because the weird thing, having discussed this album at length, I didn't have the vinyl version mm -hmm. right when uh, when it first came out. But was Great British Mistake was that the uh, last track on side two? Yeah, mm. was it? Mm. Oh, oh no, I'm being, I'm being tested. <laughs> so, so this which I just dug out of my bag. So this is the weird thing. Because when the reissues came out, um, Great British Mistake is the, the last track on the album, and I was thinking, well, that's, that's a bit weird. Take a look at this. This is the version I grew up on. Uh, the cassette uh, version on Bright Records. That. Now, have a look at the track <laughs> listing on that. Well, you know what that is, don't you? It's because uh, it's so pressed for space that they had to change the... Uh, they had to change it around... Look at that. All the tracks six, are on the wrong side, in the wrong track. order. Well, well, well. But so, you do get a nice silver cover, though. It looks very yeah, classy. Yeah. So the weird thing is years after so i'd grown up with the album oh, wow. in the wrong order really yeah well of course it's got to be the last track hasn't it yeah it's got to be I yeah mean, we was we well lecky even slowed down the tape to make that extraordinary ending you know yeah. literally by hand slowed the tape down really yeah oh, amazing it's yeah. well this is the track we're talking about which is either the end of side one if you've got the cassette or side two officially if you've got the vinyl or the reissues uh, from crossing the red sea with the adverts this is great british mistake tim thank you so much Thanks, take care fella cheers thrown at you that actually you don't personally believe in that you have to look a little sort mm -hmm. of side at, at, at the subject that's what I always tried to do around the time when, when punk was starting off and one called Wonders was a, do, you know. do you think that's one of the reasons why people took to the adverts in your work and still do probably still you know these days with your solo work is that just that slightly wry slightly cynical eye on things yeah I think everyone's got that in them mm. you know who, who wants to be part of the mainstream you know you just get flushed along with the rest mm. it's, it's always good to you know stand on the side and look at it from outside I think you can give a you can give a more kind of rounded viewpoint if you do that. Mm. Uh, it was the first single, obviously, but it's also the first track on the album, uh, which, as I say, it does paint a picture of a country which was, I think, slightly broken, but more than that, it hints, it almost hints at parts of society that were just a little bit lost mm. or isolated or had no voice, and sometimes they just weren't using their voice. Mm. That's felt, what comes across. We felt it? stuck, you know, we felt stuck. If you're growing up in 77, uh, you didn't feel part of this society that was breaking apart. You know, you, everyone knows about, you know, the bins left on the street, you know. Yeah, the strikes. Um, the, all thing. the strikes of political unrest, you know, the sense that the country w wasn't moving forward and wasn't supporting its youth. You know, we felt part of that. And there was this, you know, great urge from me and lots of other people to create that and put that into music and create a scene where we felt connected in a way because yeah. we weren't feeling we were being connected from above. So we wanted to connect ourselves. Before we go back to the influence of punk and where, where you first became a part of the scene, when did you start writing? Did you write at school? Were you encouraged at school? Yeah, to I write? did. I did write at school. I, wrote, I mean, that's what it was. It was starting and uh, we could feel something was in the air. And uh, I wanted to say something about it. And but even even then, in, in its in its lyrics, it, there was just, it had that it had the mixture of assurance and insecurity. Yeah, I well, it, it was you know I was cynical. I'm, I've always been cynical. That's yeah, that's what <laughs> from, a very, from a very early age. Uh, what, yeah, I was a cynical baby actually. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My mother tells me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean I think you have to always look at things with a with a cynical eye, really, and because uh, otherwise so much gets thrown. It's from our classic album of the day on Six Music, a record which I still believe is one of the best records of uh, the punk era and beyond, actually, a record which expressed not just a sense of it's almost frustration, but also sketched the landscape of Britain, which was a little grey and a bit cracked. Uh, it was a record about, I suppose, being at a crossroads, in a way. Uh, the album is Crossing the Red Sea with the adverts, the front man, the wordsmith of the adverts, TV Smith, is here. Thank you very much uh, for coming in. Uh, so One Chord Wonders suggests hers. You couldn't have written a better expression of punk, really. Really is an opening salvo, could you? One call cool wonders. Well, 